Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibis. Hope you guys had a great weekend. I did. I've had a great Monday. I took one of those naps where you just sort of die a little bit. And I woke up and didn't know what time of day it was. I dreamed really crazy. I'm going to have to go online later and look at those dream interpretation websites because they were weird. We'll just leave it there. All right. Real quick, I have to give a huge shout out to an amazing listener of mine named Lizzie who made some new graphics for some t-shirts. It's the What You Know Alibiers saying, I, I just have not been able to make them work. So she was like, hey, I'll do it. I love doing stuff like this. She has worked her fanny off. And these are some really cool shirts, y'all. They're in the store now. I've got some more things to put them on, like stickers. But t-shirts, hoodies, and uh, regular sweatshirts are in there now. So you can go check them out. And if you ever need any kind of graphic work like this done, like with Adobe, Lizzie B. 523 at gmail.com. She's a freelancer. She would appreciate any business. And I'm going to tell you guys, I've worked with a lot of people who do this, uh, like through Fiverr because I'm not super gifted in the Adobe area. And she nailed it the first time. Like usually it's like revision after revision on Fiverr. This girl knows what she's doing. Y'all please, please, please check her out. Lizzie L-I-Z-Z-Y-B-E-E-5-2-3 at gmail.com. If you need some graphics done, she rocks. Okay, music fact of the day before we jump in. We have a lot to cover. I did not know this. Eddie Van Halen nearly replaced the original lead guitarist for Kiss after not liking the way Van Halen's sound was going at the time. The lead guitarist had quit. Gene Simmons eventually talked Eddie out of it, saying, quote, it would cast too much of a shadow to be the guitar player in Kiss. So there you go. All right. So I'm a little behind on these Lori Vallow filings, just uh, some responses that were filed by the state. So we're going to break these apart. There are a few little things in here that are very interesting. But remember, we talked about the hair that they had just found. And I don't think it was something they just found. I misunderstood. Nate Eaton did a little video kind of summarizing these filings as well. And he thinks, this is just his opinion, this could be the hair from the duct tape that was found in the body bag used to transport JJ's remains. That would be big because it would show that she was most likely there during all that stuff we don't even need to mention, y'all. Uh, he also said, this week has been three years since they found out Chad and Lori were in Hawaii and they were making plans to go there. Time flies, right? So hopefully this April trial date will go off without a hitch. There is a hearing Thursday at 9. We should get that audio once it's finished. So we will break that down when we get that on Thursday. So the state has filed a response to Lori's attorney's filing asking she be determined to be uneligible for the death penalty. The filing says she claims she's not death eligible since she did not engage in the actual killing or intend the killing to occur. They disagree for several reasons. They say the issue isn't ripe yet, meaning she hasn't even been convicted. Number two, Idaho law allows for death for the charges she's charged with. Every person guilty of murder in the first degree shall be punished by death or by imprisonment for life, provided that a sentence of death shall not be imposed unless the prosecuting attorney filed a written notice of intent to seek the death penalty. Conspiracy is punishable to the same extent as the crimes to which the defendant has conspired. In Idaho law, if two or more persons combine or conspire to commit any crime or offense prescribed by the laws of the state of Idaho, and one or more of such persons does not does any act to affect the object of the combination or conspiracy, each shall be punishable upon conviction in the same manner 
and to the same extent as is provided under under the laws of the state of Idaho for the punishment of the crime or offenses that each combine to commit. So that was a mouthful, and I might have butchered that a tad. Sorry, y'all. I'm still in that sleep funk. You know when you take those naps and like you never recover the whole day? That's that's me right now. So y'all just gonna have to deal with like my brain and my tongue not being on the same wavelength. Sorry about that. It goes on to say the defendant is charged with conspiracy to commit murder and premeditated murder. Upon conviction and upon finding of aggravating factors by the jury, the defendant is death penalty eligible as authorized by Idaho law. The case and the filings do not apply here. They call her attempt to apply Edmund and Tyson an attempt of putting a square peg in a round hole. Remember, we went over these two cases, I believe, last week in some episodes. So you can go pull those back up. I tell in depth kind of what those cases mean. But Edmund rules that a defendant who is guilty of felony murder, but who did not commit the actual killings or did not intend for a killing to occur, cannot receive the death penalty. As the defendant notes in her brief, the Edmund court held that the punishment for a defendant must be tailored to his personal responsibility and moral guilt. Defendant's motion at two, citing Edmund, the defendant fabricates a two-prong Edmund test, which is non-existent, misleading, and not supported by Edmund, and directly contradicted by Tyson. The defendant states the two-prong test of Edmund is not met where, one, the defendant has not killed or attempted to kill, and two, does not have the intent that any of the deaths of Tylee Ryan, J.J. Vallow, or Tammy Daybell should be taken or contemplated that they would be taken. And defendant's motion at three, the ruling in Edmund does not create a two-prong test. The words two-prong never appear in Edmund, nor does the court ever create such a test. The language used by Edmund is, Edmund did not kill or intend to kill, and thus his culpability is plainly different from that of the robbers who killed. Edmund does not require that a defendant perform the actual killing to be eligible for the death penalty. It holds that a person convicted of felony murder who is a minor participant in the underlying felony and who did not kill or intend a killing cannot be executed. It further holds that punishment must be tailored to the defendant's personal responsibility and moral guilt. It is entirely consistent with Edmund that a defendant who arranges and plans a murder for someone else to carry out could receive the death penalty. The defendant's attempt to create a two-pronged test the court never articulated or intended exposes the defendant's faulty application of Edmund and Tyson in the case before the court. Felony murder is fundamentally different than premeditated murder or conspiracy to commit murder in that it requires no intent to kill, but arises out of a murder committed during the commission of another felony. Edmund is an example of a low-level participant who becomes liable for felony murder in that the defendant only intended for a robbery to occur, was the getaway driver, and was not present when the murders occurred. If Edmund had intended that a murder take place as part of the robbery, premeditated murder or conspiracy to commit murder would have been appropriate and the defendant would have been eligible for the death penalty even if he hadn't committed the actual murder. In further clarification of Edmund, the Tyson court held that an intent to kill was not required to justify the death penalty. Only a small minority of those jurisdictions imposing capital punishment for felony murder have rejected the possibility of a capital sentence absent an intent to kill. And we do not find this minority position constitutionally required. And they quote Tyson versus Arizona. A narrow focus on the question of whether or not a a given defendant intended to kill, however, is a highly unsatisfactory means of definitively distinguishing the most culpable and dangerous of murders. The Tyson court reasoned that certain people with the intent to kill, such as in self-defense, 
are not even murderers. However, those who do not intend to kill but exhibit such a callous disregard for human life, such as a torturer who doesn't care if their victim lives or dies, may justify the death penalty. We hold that the reckless disregard for human life implicit in knowingly engaging in criminal activities known to carry a grave risk of death represents a highly culpable mental state, a capital sentencing judgment when that conduct causes its natural, though also not inevitable, lethal result. In the case before the court, the defendant has not has been indicted with premeditated murder and conspiracy to commit murder. Both of these crimes differ from felony murder in that they require the state to prove that the defendant intended for her victims to die. Contrary to the assertions of the defendant, sufficient evidence existed, get this y'all, for the grand jury to find probable cause that the defendant, who is Lori, intended for her children and Tammy Daybell to die. Further, there is sufficient evidence for a jury to conclude that the defendant participating participated in the killing of her own children. Boom. That's huge because they are saying right there, they have evidence that not only Lori knew about the murders, she participated. Oh boy, April can't get here soon enough. Let's get the justice bus on the road, y'all. This intent of the defendant differentiates her from the defendants in Edmund and makes her eligible for death. As stated in Edmund, it is fundamental that causing harm intentionally must be punished more severely than causing the same harm unintentionally. The defendant states in her motion, it is well established that the death penalty is reserved for the most egregious murders. Defendant's motion further quotes Greg versus Georgia stating, the death penalty is reserved for crimes that are so grievous and affront to humanity that the only adequate response may be the penalty of death. The state concurs with these statements and for this reason has filed a notice of intent to seek death in the case before the court. The facts of this case are egregious and heinous. The evidence the state will in- introduce at trial, some of which a grand jury has already reviewed, will establish that the, the defendant intended for her children and her boyfriend's wife to die and that she affirmatively acted to make those deaths happen. Very strong but precise wording in this response by the state. In other words, they're letting Lori and everybody else know we've got the goods on her. Wow. So the defendant has failed to provide any authority whatsoever which would allow this court to apply rulings regarding felony murder to conspiracy to murder or murder in the first degree. As such, they respectfully request that the court deny her motion. So that's a little nugget that we've all sort of thought we knew. But now we kind of know that they are saying they have the goods to show a jury that she participated. And look, I don't think any of us doubted for a second that she didn't participate in some way in the deaths of her kids. She did Charles. She set it up. I mean, she was there. We still don't know who fired that gun at Charles. I'm sorry. We can say Alex all day long. But, you know, the only person alive in that room when Charles Vallow was murdered is Lori. Lori and the truth is like oil and water. We may never know. But a lot of things are going to come back to bite her, such as her saying that Alex did not know where the kids were. So... We'll see how that goes. And also, if you remember, they are not going to use a mental health defense in her trial. So that's a lot of uh, potential appeal issues kind of down the drain for her, which I'm not complaining about. But it's not going to be as, I guess, scrutinized after the verdict about her mental status not coming into play. Because they're saying... Although her lawyers clearly have advised her against this. You could tell in that filing they were not on board with her deciding to do this. But we will see soon enough. All right. So also the state objected to Chad's motion to continue. 
So let's go through some dates with Chad. May 26, 2021. That was his initial appearance. June 9th, 2021. He had an arraignment in district court. August 5th, 2021, the intent to seek death was announced against Chad. Remember, during this point, Lori was incompetent and was at the state mental hospital. Her case was on hold. Chad's was not. August 20th, 2021, Chad waived his right to a speedy trial and the trial was vacated. So the state originally asked for the trial to be held in the fall of 2023. In September of 2022, Chad asked the trial to begin January. Right now, that trial should, would have been going on, by the way, but then asked for a continuance, and the state did not object due to the joint trial with Lori being vacated. Remember, they want to keep this trial together. They're co-defendants. It's the same set of facts. They're moving this trial to Boise. There's a million reasons to not sever these cases. The state has consistently opposed any improper severance and continues to hold that position. So, May 26 of 2021, Lori's initial appearance. April 19th of 2021, or 2022, was her arraignment. So, remember, they stopped that hearing on May 26, 2021, due to the competency issues. So it wasn't until almost a year later, April 19th of 2022, she has her arraignment. May 2nd, 2022, notice to seek death is filed. So remember, she did not waive her right to a speedy trial, and the January 2023 date was set. Our next partner is Athletic Greens. I take AG1 by Athletic Greens literally every day. I gave AG1 a try because I'm always busy and my diet isn't the best, but I still want to get all the vitamins my body needs without taking a ton of pills. I take AG1 in the morning before my first cup of coffee and it makes me feel ready to take on my day. Why take a bunch of different things when you can just mix one scoop of powder in water once a day? It's the healthiest thing you can do in under a minute. With one scoop, I'm getting 75 vitamins and minerals that help my mood, energy levels, and healthier hair, skin, and nails. It's delivered to me every month, and it's been the easiest way to arm my body with everything it needs to tackle my day. If you're looking for an easier way to take supplements, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com slash what the world. That's athleticgreens.com slash what the world. Check it out. We know that as a busy parent, you don't have time to completely overhaul your life in the new year. One change that's easy to make that will make your life easier in 2023 is Little Spoon. Most of the baby and kid foods at the grocery store is heavily processed and often on the shelf longer than your little one has been in this world. Not cool and not the quality nutrition our kids deserve. Little Spoon makes everything fresh, organic, and uses absolutely nothing artificial. It's just like homemade, all delivered to your door and ready in seconds. From baby food to big kid, Little Spoon has you covered for years. Little Spoon even hides vegetables and chicken nuggets, mac and cheese, and more. Their smoothies come in pouches that make on-the-go snack easy, healthy, and tasty. And yes, I tried one. They're great. Did I mention it comes right to your door? It's flexible, easy, and everything stores in the refrigerator or freezer. You can pick your menu for a variety of foods to introduce to your child. The price is right. The quality is unmatched. So make this year's chaos a little more manageable with time-saving, delicious, and healthy meals and snacks your kids will love. Go to littlespoon.com and enter my code WHATTHEWORLD at checkout to get 50% off your first Little Spoon order. That's littlespoon.com and enter WHATTHEWORLD for 50% off at checkout. September 23rd is when we had that new competency proceeding begin for Lori, and they vacated the trial that should be going on right now. Lori was deemed competent. The new trial date set for April 3rd, and that date is still in stone. Chad now wants, again, a continuance. He argues his defense team cannot reasonably be prepared for an April trial. The reasons are similar to the September 2022 motion, but this is inconsistent with representations from counsel, they note in the filing. On October 13th of last year, defense attorney Pryor said he would be ready for trial in January of this year. 
The state says his defense has had over three months to prepare for trial from the last filing for a continuance, which was also denied. They also say, furthermore, as this court pointed out on its recent order on defendants' objection to the court's scheduling order, which was issued on December 16th of last year, Chad mistakes the court's um, admonition in the October 28th order as a concession that the defense is entitled to more time to prepare for defense. To be clear, the court's comments were a note that Chad's counsel has revealed it has not prepared to meet previously issued deadlines, and the comments were not intended to conclude Daybell has been denied ample time to prepare for trial. The court, let's see, there's no constitutional right or requirement for a mitigation expert. Now, remember, a mitigation expert is going to come in if he's been found guilty, and they will tell all the reasons maybe his childhood was messed up or his little bump to his noggin when he got the veil torn and they'll, they'll present reasons that his past should be taken into account to not give him death. And so it says that Chad says his rights safeguarded by amendments in the constitution and the Idaho state constitution is one reason to grant the continuance, but the defendant fails to provide how any of these rights or provisions will be violated if he's not allowed a continuance to allow his mitigation specialist more time. Why have we not had a mitigation specialist on board since death was announced? The defendant clearly acknowledges that the requirement for a mitigation specialist is actually contained only in professional guidelines, which are not constitutional rights or guarantees. The defendant indicates he waited until August of last year, and it is clear this decision was made knowing the trial was set to begin for January of 2023 at that time. The defendant is now arguing the fact he chose to delay obtaining a mitigation expert is not only grounds for a continuance, but would be a basis for the granting of a new trial if the court proceeds with the April dates. The state, of course, disagrees with this assessment. The decision not to obtain a mitigation specialist until August of last year, when the defendant has known since August 5th of 2021, when the state announced its intention to seek death, is a strategic decision left to the discretion of the defendant and his counsel. There is no constitutional right or obligation for a mitigation specialist to be obtained. The state does not disagree. The defendant should be allowed to present mitigating evidence and is entitled to an individualized sentencing. However, none of the case law cited by the defendant references that requirement or need for a mitigation specialist, simply that mitigation evidence is allowed and necessary. The distinction between the obligation to present relevant evidence in mitigation and hiring a particular staff person titled mitigation specialist, is exceptionally important. One is an obligation. The other is an optional staffing choice. (laughs) Got a little jab in there, didn't you? The defendant cites uh, Fireson versus Woodford to support the position that the defense counsel must employ a mitigation specialist and perform as complete and thorough of an investigation as the defendant asserts must be done. However, in that case, although counsel's duty to seek out evidence of mitigation is not limitless, the Supreme Court has recognized that the failure to pursue avenues of readily available information, such as school records, juvenile court and probation reports, and hospital records may constitute deficient performance. The Supreme Court has also made clear when counsel is on notice that important mitigation evidence exists, a failure to uncover and present such evidence at the penalty phase represents ineffective assistance of counsel. So they go through a bunch of case law and then continue. Counsel has represented the defendant for over three years regarding the allegations part of this case. Presumably, given the length and nature of the representation, it would seem the defendant has had adequate time 
to consult with his counsel and provide him information necessary to obtain any relevant documents and evidence for use in the mitigation phase. Again, the defendant is simply basing the request for a continuance on the fact that he decided that rather than gather mitigation documentation through investigators or subpoenas, they now want to add staff to the team labeled as a mitigation specialist in August of last year, several months before trial, because at that point, it was set for January. There's no evidence that Mr. Daybell's personal history is so complex or unique as to require a u- unique method of protract. Uh, or protracted period of record gathering, certainly none that cannot be accomplished in the eight months the specialist has been on the defense team. So there you go. You got, now we know they've had a mitigation specialist working for eight months. So um, the defense motion does not include any references to a particular type of evidence that the defendant needs to obtain through the specialist, which cannot or has not already been obtained In the time before the trial, there's no evidence that Mr. Daybell's educational, social, mental health, or family records have not or cannot be obtained in time for use at the trial in three months. The defendant continues to harp on the outstanding discovery from the state and claims this is a reason for a continuance. However, the state has until February 23rd, 2023 to provide all discovery. Furthermore, the remedy for any outstanding discovery is not necessarily a continuance of a trial, but instead could include the exclusion of evidence and other remedies if appropriate or necessary. The defendant is aware of the nature of outstanding discovery. It is premature to conclude he will need an additional expert analysis or that it will take more than three months to complete such a report, assessment, and or evaluation. Furthermore, by far, the bulk of the discovery has been completed in this case. Again, the defendant relies on guidelines rather than any constitutional guarantee or potential violation of any constitutional rights. Additionally, the state has not continued to object to specific discovery requests from the defendant. The state has objected to the duplicate request with regards to items that have already been provided some on multiple occasions, and also some that simply do not exist. Wherefore, the state requests the courts deny, deny the defendant's motion to continue. So you have to wonder, it's kind of like it's go time. Is he starting to freak out and just wants to delay the inevitable? Because there's been several times that John Pryor has made clear My client's been in jail for this long, and it's not fair, and we want to go to trial, although he waived his right to a speedy trial. It's sort of, you know, which one is it, dude? Are you ready to go? You're not ready to go, but I think you're going in April, so get ready. All right, so we are moving on to poor little Athena Brownfield. The search for Athena, unfortunately, they've announced today is now a recovery operation And that was uh, put out there by the Oklahoma Bureau of Investigators. Uh, Athena was reported missing on January 10th. As we know, her sister was found by a postal worker, frightened, scared, hungry. Uh, But investigators have learned it could have been weeks before that January 10th date that little Athena went missing. And shortly after I finished Friday's episode, it was announced the second caregiver had been arrested on Thursday. It was actually the same day that the other caregiver, Alyssa, was arrested. But now the warrant for him is first-degree murder and child neglect. Avon Adams is the husband of Alyssa, and the warrant also left the firearm or other weapon use box unchecked. And it says he was not under the influence at the time of the crime. It also states he lived with the victim. So all signs point to this is for little Athena coupled with a recovery operation. He's waived his extradition to Oklahoma. And apparently there was evidence on his phone that he had hurt Athena, but authorities have not elaborated on what that is. On Saturday, investigators were searching a large reservoir in Grady County, Oklahoma. It's about a 30 or 40 minute drive from where Athena lived. And police say they've been searching bodies of water all along. 
this was no different, but I think maybe with, with him in custody, the first degree murder, maybe phone pings have come back. Maybe they have a little more than they want to say, which is understandable. Also yesterday, investigators were back at the home and she lived there with her sister, her caregivers. I believe they had children together. They executed a search warrant, but no other information was given. So moving on to Billy Wagner, I haven't updated this. It's been out for about a week, but I just keep forgetting to throw it in there. He'll be back in court this Wednesday, January the 18th, for a pretrial hearing. And prosecutor Rob Junk told a local paper that Billy's trial has been on hold, obviously, since George's trial. And he doesn't expect anything earth-shattering at this hearing coming up. But, hey, they're moving along. And I, a lot of people have asked me if I plan on covering this trial, and it depends. Number one, is this trial going to bump into Vallo Daybell? And if it does, then I will cover Billy's trial very, very loosely. I'm planning to go up to Idaho a good bit during Lori and Chad's trial. So it would just be hard if those are, are simultaneous. This is impossible. It's going to be a lot of the same evidence, I believe. Um, there may be some variations that are very specific to Billy, but I think overall it's going to be a lot of the same evidence that we've already heard. So it just sort of depends on that date. He hasn't been in court in almost a year. His last hearing was actually February 1st of last year. His trial was supposed to have begun last year on Halloween, October the 31st, but it was canceled on August the 15th, which was two weeks before George's trial began. There are still 41 defense motions the judge hasn't ruled on, including dismissing the possibility of the death penalty to not allow photos of the victims at the trial and get this, prohibit victim impact statements during the trial or sentencing. Good luck with all all those. Well, the dismissing of the death penalty, again, is going to rely on Jake and Angela's testimony. They are expected, I believe, to testify at his trial. So if they do so to the state's satisfaction, like George Wagner, they'll dismiss that death penalty. So who's going to preside over the trial? Well, Prosecutor Rob Junk, as we know, is set to fill Judge Deering's shoes, but he can't preside over Billy's trial. It's a conflict of interest because he prosecuted the other, other three. So what would happen if Deering stays? He would need a courtroom in Pike County. And if another judge fills in, it actually could require a change of venue. Rob Junk said, I assume Judge Deering will want to talk to us about his role in the case, if any, after his retirement and that could be discussed at this hearing coming up this week. Okay, so last last thing of the day, Dateline for the University of Idaho murders. It was great to see Lauren and Dr. John on there. They are all over the place with this case, and they're always so interesting to listen to. And I just love seeing, seeing them uh, spread their wings and, and go out further. They're just good people, too. By the way, a lot of people have asked what this picture is back here. This is a group photo from CrimeCon. It has me, Lori Hellis, Lauren, Dr. John, uh, Joseph Scott Morgan, and I can't look back there. Uh, um, Julie, Julie uh, Kay and Larry Woodcock. There's a bunch of us in there. Kathy Russin. That's like my favorite picture from CrimeCon. It's, uh, so yeah, I need to get a bigger one though because we all look like little, little bobbleheads back there. All right, so what did we learn on this episode of Dateline about the University of Idaho murders? It was a very good episode. If you haven't seen it, I recommend you watch it. I did not know that the night before the murders, there was a party at the house with about 150 people in attendance, which again made this a DNA nightmare. Kaylee's mom said she got a phone call the morning of the murders from a relative who had connections in Moscow and was told something bad had happened to Kaylee. So Kaylee's mom tried to call her no answer and then tried to call Maddie. She said, I, she said, everybody needs to relax because if something happened to Kaylee last night, Maddie would have called me. Oh man. Soon after the sheriff's office sent someone to notify them of Kaylee and Maddie's murder. A young lady named Martha was on the show and she had been at the Sigma Chi party the night before she had hung out with Zana a good bit that night as well. And the next morning, she was meeting with classmates at noon for a project at the Sigma Chi house. They were actually waiting on Ethan's brother, Hunter. 
So they called and asked if he was coming, and he said, no, he thinks Ethan is dead. She tried texting Xana and was later told Xana was unfortunately dead as well. She said initially they didn't know if it was maybe something like carbon monoxide poison, and they stood in a big giant circle and watched the beginnings of the investigation happen. Next, they got that alert from the university that police were investigating a homicide at the house. That had to be so surreal. Greg Rogers, who's a retired FBI agent, was on the show and talked about the weapon being a knife. He thinks this was chosen to instill fear in the victims. He said he could have easily acquired a handgun if, if he wanted one, legally or illegally. He chose a knife on purpose to really scare the victims and get control. Also, referring to the witness account from the roommate, Dylan, when she heard the person alleged to be Koberger say, it's okay, I'm going to help you. Uh, Mr. Greg Rogers, the retired FBI agent, said if the one roommate's statements are accurate about what she heard, he was well rehearsed. He's he th he thinking about he's thinking about this for a long time. He's well versed in the psychological aspect of how people think and behave during a crime. He's trying to calm them down and doesn't want them to scream or alert their roommates. And then also talking about the fact that there was no sexual assault, Dr. John from Hidden True Crime said the murderer needed to get in and out quickly. So if there were fan fantasies about an assault, he probably realized he wouldn't be able to pull that off with so many people in the house. A former high school schoolmate of Brian said he used to get bullied by girls and also what we've heard before that he was overweight in high school. And a student of Coburgers from Washington State express frustration of how harshly he graded assignments. We've heard that as well. He, he said his argument was, you're not telling us we did it wrong. You're telling us how you would have done it at your PhD level, and then you're taking our points for it. The New York Post is reporting on some comments Koberger made as a teenager in a forum called Tap Talk or tap -a talk He was 16 at the time he wrote this, and he said he had, quote, no emotion and felt little remorse for his actions as a teenager. He also said, as I hug my family, I look into their faces, I see nothing. It's like I'm looking at a video game, but less. He also wrote, I feel like an organic sack of meat with no self-worth. He saw himself as a sickly, tired, useless, and stupid man who was battling the constant thought of harming himself and did not deserve to live. He added, nothing I do is enjoyable. I'm blank. I have no opinion. I have no emotion. I have nothing. Can you relate? So just a little insight into the psyche of a 16-year-old Coburger there. I think they have verified that was him. So that's all for today. Tomorrow we'll pick up and bring you the latest in all the cases we're covering. This week I really would like to do sort of a what do we know so far about the Alec Murdoch murder trial that's coming up as soon as next week. I may, depending on if the judge allows media there, for jury selection, if they do, I'll be down there next week. If not, I'll go for openings. But really excited to be doing this for a long crime network. And also the podcast going to stay the same every night. Recap in an hour of the eight hours of testimony to keep you up to date with what's happening in that courtroom. So it's going to be a busy few weeks for me, but I love it. By the way, Grammy's doing way better. She's great to have around. And she's going to stay here when I'm gone. I have family literally a stone's throw away in all directions. So it's easier to take care of her and, um, and I'll be home on the weekend. So yeah, uh, busy few weeks coming up for me, but Hey, wouldn't have it any other way. All right, guys, we'll see you tomorrow. Hope you have a good evening. Mm -hmm.